Even after a decade of FISMA, its foundational concepts of hazard analysis and risk-based controls still bring up questions as to the differences between hazard and risk. I am your TAG Talks host, Lisa Lupo, and today I'm talking with TAG Director of Food Safety, Brent Kobolish, on what hazard and risk really mean in food establishments. Good afternoon, Brent. Good afternoon, Lisa. So let's start with the basics. How do risk and hazard differ? And why is that important in preventive control decision-making? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of individuals struggle with what is risk, what is hazard, how do they relate, how don't they relate, but ge generally they relate. However, the hazard piece is really the easy piece. It's really identifying in food or feed any biological, chemical, or physical agent that has the potential to do harm. Where risk comes into play, though, is that hazard times exposure equals risk. I think a lot of times individuals conflate the two, that risk is hazard or hazard is risk, and that's not necessarily true. I think what, what many people really don't um, fully appreciate is that <clears throat> You have to have you have to understand the exposure that may be associated with a given hazard identified. Um, you know, as a toxicologist, the father of modern toxicology, Paracelsus, uh, coined the phrase that the dose makes the poison, and that's exactly right. Not the dose unmakes the poison as well. So, if we look at the risk paradigm, risk equals hazard times exposure. That is ultimately what risk and what we're going towards in terms of ensuring the safety of the food and feed supply. So you can't just identify the hazard and that automatically equals risk. Uh, if we look at how FISMA is trained and how the Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance looks at risk, you know, I talk about dose times exposure. They look at it from likelihood or occurrence times severity which is another way of looking at it as well. So I'm gonna um, ask you to kind of elaborate on one of those points when you said also that dose unmakes the poison. Tell me about that a little bit more. Well, for instance, water is a neurotoxin. At a certain dose, uh, water can cause neurotoxicity. Uh, however, at a lot, of, a lot of other different doses, in fact, we need water to survive, it's not gonna cause neurotoxicity. So anything can be a hazard at a certain dose. Botulinum toxin is probably one of the most potent toxins we know of, requires a very, very small dose to elicit a very significant adverse health response. And like I said, with water, um, it requires a lot of water or a larger dose to elicit its adverse health response. So, you know, when this idea of dose really is chemical specific, um, and generally we look at doses um, from a pragmatic standpoint in terms of what is the likelihood you're going to be exposed at that certain level to elicit an adverse health re response. And that's where the risk comes in. So if you identify a chemical, uh, a, a chemical that may be, associated with your ingredient and or product, it may be identified as a hazard that has the potential to cause an adverse health event at a certain dose, but that's where the risk comes in. If you're never going to achieve that dose, then you don't really have to worry about the risk. The risk is not going to be zero, but it's going to be negligible or very low. And that's why we get the term risk-based preventive controls, not hazard based preventive controls. However, if we look um, to other regulatory agencies around the world, a lot of agencies take a precautionary based approach to their assessments. They sometimes take a hazard based approach. And risk is not, all, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to manage risk if you're not comfortable dealing in the gray space, which is where risk assessment lies. And we always have to look at this idea of population-based risk assessment versus individualized risk assessment, because that sets public health policy. Uh, when you look at it from a population-based standpoint, not a 
not an individualized standpoint. Okay, so when we do talk about managing these risks that we've identified through the hazards and then made the risk assessment, mm -hmm. how do we go about managing that? Who needs to be involved? Yeah, it's a great, that's a great question. I, that there are three parts of the risk paradigm, I'll call them. First, it starts with assessment, then management, how we're gonna manage the determination of the assessment, and then how do we communicate that risk? And it really involves a diverse set of, of thinkers, uh, different experts uh, throughout an organization. Now, this these experts could include legal experts, regulatory experts, safety experts, engineers, it all depends on what you're looking at in terms of the risk. Again, you know, risk is in our everyday life, not just food and feed, but specifically to food and feed, where I found the best way to uh, make a good risk assessment is really you start with the science. Science has to start the day, but it doesn't necessarily end the day. Um, and so that's where the assessment comes in. What is the true, what is the risk of the of the given chemical, uh, if you will, uh, presents, what, what risk does that present to your food, feed product you are producing, okay? So you start with that and that's the assessment. The second part of that is the risk management paradigm is how are we gonna manage that? Are we gonna destroy product? Are we gonna recall product? Are we not gonna do anything? You know, so often people wanna say, well, we've gotta do something. Well, doing nothing is something. And sometimes that's the right approach. Uh, and we often forget that. And sometimes it's managing through maybe not a safety risk, but you have a regulatory risk, meaning that you have a compliance issue. Say you have an out of tolerance pesticide residue, which more often than not is going to be more of a compliance risk than a safety risk. Uh, and how do you manage through that? Do we, again, do we recall product? Uh, if the product's in our control, can we rework it? Maybe not for pesticides, but for, you know, an out-of-spec protein um, protein percentage that we're supposed to meet. So it's more of a quality uh, risk that we're dealing with. So there's different management that you have to go through. And that's where you pull together individuals, a diverse set of knowledgeable individuals about, about, about your product portfolio, um, how the product's made. So this may include uh, plant personnel. It could be engineers, et cetera, to make an appropriate decision. And then you get to the risk communication. And this, it, both internal and external, very important. I found in my career that a lot of times we as industry want to communicate risk externally or, or what, whatever we want to communicate is more externally focused when we have individuals that we work side by side with that we're consumers ourselves, that, that, that message may not be directed towards us. And if you can't win over the individuals within your own organization, how do you expect to win over the general populace, if you will, of consumers? Okay. And we think that's lost a, a little bit on our risk communication strategies internally. Certainly, I, I've, I've not focused on that in my career, but the more and more I learn, the more and more we have to bring along individuals that may not necessarily be at the decision-making table, but are totally relevant in being champions for our brands, our products, and what we do. And if they can't trust what we do, you know, how's that going to go, go forward with regards to safety culture within our facility, within our own company, et cetera? And again, just like management doing nothing, sometimes do we say anything? Sometimes saying something makes the situation worse. And so I think the assessment, the management, communication are all important in their own right and have a, a very significant consequence if they're not done correctly. One of my colleagues uh, at a previous organization in which I worked said, she said, good discussions lead to good decisions. So if you find yourself in a particular situation where you may be conducting a risk assessment, doing the manage, the risk management, as well as the risk communication, you should ask yourself, who, who else should I involve to make sure from a checks and balances standpoint, 
do we have the right approach at each step? Uh, and that's where diversity of thought, different experiences, different functional leaders or individuals within different functions, whether it's legal, regulatory, like I talked about, marketing, uh, supply chain, logistics, those individuals are going to bring experiences and expertise to the table to make you have to, to allow the group to have a really great discussion so that the right decisions are made at each step in the risk paradigm. So I guess kind of in brief, how does TAG help its clients in this area? Well, TAG has really, we have a diverse set of not only subject matter experts, but individuals who have a diverse set of backgrounds. And those experiences and backgrounds uh, really allow us to help an individual client assess risk at each part of that paradigm. For instance, you know, to speak for myself, I've been involved in each set of that risk paradigm, risk assessment, management, uh, communication directly. And I've, I've worked uh, up and down the supply chain in the food and feed supply chain to uh, really help bring that expertise, bring that experience to the table so that an individual client, whether they're seeking an assessment, management, or, or communication, um, or all three uh, in response to a given opportunity that they've come across, we can provide that expertise. And I'm just speaking for myself, but many other individuals within TAG has that experience or even more so that experience. And in different parts of the supply chain or different, you know, whether it be seafood, you know, other USDA protein, um, uh, you know, so chicken, poultry, uh, beef, or consumer packaged goods, let's say flour milling, et cetera. We bring all those experiences to the table to help a client really get their arms wrapped around that whole risk paradigm so that going forward, they can have the right decision make the right decision as it relates to all those. And then going forward, making sure that, they, that they've that they conducted a root cause analysis to make sure that it never happens again. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that diverse set of thinking, the experiences that we bring to the table that we can really help a client excel in this space. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Brent. Um, we really hope that our viewers have been able to gain a great deal of further insight into um, all kinds of aspects of risk management and communication and assessment, as you said. And know that uh, viewers that you can call on Brent or any of our other TAG experts for further questions and assistance. And be sure to check out TAG's full line of TAG Talks videos on YouTube and click to subscribe to stay up to date on all things food safety and public health from the TAG experts. Thank you. Thank you.